Okay. So, so last time we were talking about complexity and compartmentalization as being one of the more defining elements um, of a complex um, eukaryotic cell as we know it today, right? And the fact that it evolved from something that is more, um, uh, more primal, uh, more minimal um, in the eukaryotic cell, right? And one of the ideas was um, this hypothesis that there could be um, the uptake of one cell by the other, which um, could have be been the beginning um, of this complexity, right? Um, and, and it's a remarkable thing that, um, you know, there are these leaps uh, that happen every once in a while. Um, and in all fairness, um, during evolution, at least as we know it, uh, these leaps have happened only very, uh, you know, seldomly, or at least um, have happened in a way that allows you to see the leap in the sense that the leap has stayed um, and um, existed long enough for us to discover the leap. Uh, that kind of scenario has existed only a few times, right? And um, uh, both in context of uh, mitochondria or chloroplasts, um, such a leap could have happened, right? And these could have happened uh, independently. They could have happened, um, you know, a few million years apart. Uh, we don't necessarily know whether they all happened at around the same time, uh, right? And, and those details still elude us. It's probably very difficult to, uh, to know that as well, right? Um, and there could be a leap uh, like that waiting to happen. You know, it may happen in, in the next 10 years. It could happen in the next million years, um, which could change the course of how um, we live um, and cells live, right? And, and so that possibility um, is always there. Um, and a lot of this is attributed to um, quite remarkable um, scientist whose um, uh, theory is the endosymbion theory proposed in 1981. Um, Lynn Margolis um, came up with this hypothesis uh, that this could have happened. Um, and there is now increasing evidence to suggest uh, that we have um, organelles or um, remnants of these organisms in the, in the form of these organelles uh, that um, effectively suggest that uh, you know, they could have come together this way. And, and as I said, uh, the mitochondria is a good um, example of this. The, uh, the whole idea of the endosymbiont theory, of course, is that um, you know, it, it's uh, endo, which is inside, and symbiont, which is a friend. And uh, the fact that these two symbionts came together uh, and increasingly became dependent on each other allowed for, um, you know, for this complexity to evolve. Now, one of the um, rate uh, limiting steps here, right, or one of the reasons uh, why such an end endosymbiont being taken in um, led to the complexity of eukaryotic cells may have also to do with the fact as to what was that symbiotic relationship and also the fact that this um, endosymbiont that was taken in, uh, you know, was able to add significantly to the energy availability to this other cell, right? Um, it's possible that more than one endosymbiont uh, was taken in at some point of time and that further uh, made it possible to have more energy in this uh, now uh, symbiont cell, right? The cell where these two or three or more um, uh, prokaryotic cells were now together. Um, and, and that may have allowed uh, for other changes to happen. It may have allowed these, this cell now, this um, cell that is a coming together of cells, um, to be able to invest in things that um, cells earlier may not have been able to. So it's highly possible that this coming together kept ha happening many times till the right kind of combination came together, right? And that now allowed um, for that particular kind of cell um, to thrive and do well, right? And we, we, we don't necessarily know uh, if how many times uh, this happened before, um, you know, we got a cell that actually, um, you know, could, could grow further and divide and, and kind of keep, um, you know, some of that complexity, right? Um, the mitochondria obviously is a, is a very striking example of this, right? And, um, and, and many of you probably have read already about it and, and you know what the mitochondria is capable of. Um, and there are some very striking aspects about the mitochondria, right? Um, and one among them is the fact that the mitochondria has a double membrane. 
right? Now we'll come to the membrane next when we discuss both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Um, and, um, but the thing to remember is that that boundary of a cell um, or a boundary that um, a structure that eventually became a cell, uh, right, is very, very vital uh, to the evolution of these structures. The fact that those boundaries could be formed um, is what uh, effectively defined the origin um, of a cellular structure, uh, even, uh, you know, before complexity evolved, right, the primary cellular structure. Um, and, and in the mitochondria, uh, there is an outer membrane and an inner membrane, um, and the outer and inner membrane have um, both existed or both exist now uh, in uh, the mitochondria that is present in our cells. Uh, and it's unique in that sense uh, as compared to other organelles. There are very few things in the, in the, in the eukaryotic cell that have these two membranes. And it's, it's thought to be a remnant uh, of the fact that this mitochondria, when it came in, uh, came with its membrane and as it went into this cell was covered by the membrane of this cell as well. So, uh, you know, it now has um, these two membranes that exist there. Uh, the, the presence of these two membranes makes a, has a very important role in how uh, the electron transport chain that works in the mitochondria works and how energy or ATP is generated in the mitochondria. Um, so if you're interested, go look up what that, uh, uh, that bilayer membrane, uh, that membrane, um, having two membranes means uh, to the mitochondria. The other interesting thing about the mitochondria is the genetic code in the mitochondria is very interesting, um, right? And, and you know, let me get to that first, yeah. Um, and um, it has its own DNA. Um, and the mitochondrial uh, genome is very distinctly different from uh, the, the nucleus. And, and it's interesting uh, that the genetic material of this uh, endosymbion has existed after so many millions or billions of years um, in a form that allows us to tell that this is distinctly different from the genetic material of this parent cell that lies in the nucleus. Right. Um, among the things is the is the way the uh, genetic code is read is distinctly different, um, and um, and there are many other similarities. Goes to talk about uh, structure, genome, uh, the base repair system. Uh, you know how to correct errors in the DNA, for example, uh, is very distinctly different in the mitochondria. All of this suggesting that um, it's a structure that. Um, could not um, have come in any other way other than it having existed independently and, and possibly being taken in. So all of this supports the idea of the, of the endosymbiont. Um, the other interesting aspect is also that, um, that there are versions of this mitochondria, okay, or versions of such an endosymbiont that are present in, in varying, um, uh, you know, species. Um, and, and that's also interesting because they are all not the same thing, right? Um, and the mitochondria, as we know it in a mammalian cell, there is a slightly different version that exists in some other organisms, which leads us to think that it's highly possible that this kind of uptake right, of something being taken up by the other may have happened in more than one place, in more than one form, uh, may be happening even now as we speak. Um, and the fact that uh, the coming together of what two things come together could have had a significant impact in the outcome of that coming together, right? And so there are many coming togethers that may have happened uh, that eventually uh, may have given rise, um, you know, to, uh, to the mammalian cell and to all these other variants that exist, right? So, so clearly this is, um, you know, evolution working in ways that allows for certain properties or traits to be selected. But the important point is that the idea that such an intake can happen um, seems to be fairly, um, you know, there is now convincing evidence to suggest that that is likely to have happened, right? Um, and, um, and both these um, organisms, right, the, the uptaker and, and the endosymbiont, right, um, have benefited from this. That's the only way this could have sustained um, and existed for as long as it has, right? And, and this now, as I uh, you know, showed earlier as well, um, there are varying uh, 
you know, improvements that could happen in the cell. Um, and, and this is seen across the evolutionary, uh, you know, bandwidth, right? Um, that you could see uh, all these, um, uh, you know, modifications, enhancements that are happening in cell um, cells as uh, they acquire one or more of these uh, endosymbionts. So it's highly possible that the coming together of these or this uptake uh, could have been uh, the early event, right? And not just one endosymbiont, there could have been more than one endosymbiont that was taken up uh, that um, now allows uh, for complexity to evolve. Um, and, and this has then led to all the other little organelles that we know of. Uh, but the beginning of it all, the beginning of all this complexity uh, may have originated from the fact that there is this uh, ability uh, of um, endosymbionts to exist, right? And thrive and do well as well. So, so that's, um, that's the um, you know, understanding of the endosymbiont theory.